The FBI director is fired amidst an ongoing inquiry into Russian meddling in the U.S. election, while the battle against ISIS continues in Afghanistan and Syria. Deputy Assistant to the President, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, is here with analysis. And the beauty of Gregorian chant once again hits the Billboard classical charts this week with Requiem. The superior of the fraternity of St. Peter and their musical director joins us. And Fatima at 100. How relevant is the Fatima message today? As the Pope visits the pilgrimage site, we will talk with Father Thomas Petri. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, music from the Fraternity of St. Peter, and Father Thomas Petrie are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout, or you can email us at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. The bombshell news of the week, President Donald Trump abruptly fired FBI Director James Comey Tuesday, dramatically ousting the nation's top law enforcement official. In a letter to Comey, Trump said the firing was necessary to restore public trust and confidence in the FBI. Comey, the most controversial bureau leader since J. Edgar Hoover, had come under intense scrutiny in recent months for his public comments on an investigation into Democrat Hillary Clinton's email practices, including a pair of letters he sent to Congress on the matter in the closing days of last year's presidential campaign. The firing comes amid an FBI investigation into whether Trump's campaign had ties to Russia's meddling in the presidential election. More on this, the reaction from Capitol Hill, and its potential fallout on the Trump agenda in our next segment. And more trouble for the Affordable Care Act as the nation's third largest health insurer says it will completely divorce itself from all state marketplace exchanges. Aetna announced this week that it is pulling out of Nebraska and Delaware next year after projecting a $200 million loss this year. The insurers, among others who have already pulled out of several states, Aetna said they lost about $450 million in 2016. Despite government subsidies, most of the Obamacare exchanges have not been able to maintain sufficient numbers of enrollees without having to significantly raise premiums or take a loss. A third of the country is down to only one marketplace insurer, and industry experts expect that some Americans will have no marketplace insurer in 2018. Back on Capitol Hill, the Senate Republicans have begun to deliberate an Obamacare repeal and replacement bill. And the state of Texas took the lead in the immigration debate when Governor Greg Abbott signed a sanctuary city's ban this week. The law allows police to ask anyone apprehended about their immigration status, including routine traffic stops. It threatens local sheriffs with prosecution if they fail to cooperate with federal immigration authorities. Abbott signed the measure on Facebook Live on May 6th with no advance notice. Opponents of the new law immediately vowed to issue a court challenge, calling the legislation discriminatory. If allowed to stand, the new law goes into effect on September 1st. Meanwhile, arrests of illegal immigrants caught trying to enter the United States from Mexico declined again last month. Border arrests have plummeted since President Donald Trump took office, and he is taking credit. The president has highlighted the falling numbers as a sign that his approach and his rhetoric on immigration is working. On the ground, border agents say would-be migrants believe they'll be deported to Mexico if apprehended. There were still 11,000 border arrests in April. However, that is down 1,000 compared to March, the lowest number of arrests in a month since the 1990s. And some good news out of Nigeria as 82 Chipok schoolgirls came home this week, three years after being kidnapped by the Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram. 
The girls aged 16 to 18 were released following a controversial prisoner swap with the government of Nigeria. Five top Boko Haram militants were set free in the deal, according to Nigerian officials. This is the second group of hostages recovered since October of last year, when 21 girls were released. Of the 276 girls abducted by Boko Haram in April of 2014, 113 still remain in captivity. An Indonesian court on Tuesday sentenced the minority Christian governor of Jakarta to two years in prison for blaspheming the Quran. The five-judge panel pronounced the Jakarta governor guilty and ordered his immediate arrest. The court ruled that the governor's comments during the re-election campaign that he lost degraded and insulted Islam. The governor said that people are being deceived if they believe the Quran forbids Muslims from voting for non-Muslims. His comments led to massive protests and now a jail term. Back in the U.S., Vice President Mike Pence said on Thursday that the Christian faith is under siege around the world and that the Islamic State is guilty of nothing short of genocide against Christians. Speaking at the first of its kind World Summit in defense of persecuted Christians, Mike Pence said the Trump administration is focusing on the plight of persecuted Christians and it is not shying away from calling these acts of violence what they are. Around, we see believers tortured for confessing Christ and women and children sold into the most terrible form of human slavery. Know today with assurance that President Trump sees these crimes for what they are, vile acts of persecution animated by hatred, hatred for the gospel of Christ. And so too does the President know those who perpetrate these crimes. They are the embodiment of evil in our time. And he calls them by name, radical Islamic terrorists. Pence went on to say, protecting and promoting religious freedom is a foreign policy priority of the Trump administration. And a company in Australia is offering embryo jewelry. According to the parenting blog Kidspot, Amy McGlade began crafting jewelry in 2014 and is now using the destroyed and cremated remains of in vitro embryos, preserving them in resin. McGlade touts her company as the only one in the world that creates jewelry from human embryos, calling her work pioneering and sacred art. One mother who wears her seven extra embryos in a heart-shaped pendant said that when they completed their family, it wasn't in her heart to destroy them. Now, she said, they are forever with me in a beautiful keepsake. In Evangelium Vitae, Pope St. John Paul II wrote that a person's rightful due is to be treated as an object of love, not as an object for use. And finally, this Saturday marks the 100th anniversary of the Marian apparitions at Fatima. It was on May 13, 1917, that the Virgin Mary began appearing to three shepherd children in Fatima, Portugal. Pope Francis released a video message this week in advance of his two-day visit there, saying he comes as a pilgrim of peace and entrusts the world to Mary's immaculate heart. During his Wednesday audience, he encouraged the young, the infirm, and newlyweds to trust the Mother of God. While in Portugal, Pope Francis will preside over the canonizations of two of the Fatima visionaries, Francisco and Jacinta Marto, in his first visit to the Marian Shrine. We'll have more on the papal visit and the message of Fatima later in the program. And the Will Wilder Book Tour is wrapping up. I'll be in the Boston, Massachusetts area at the Boston Marriott on Commonwealth Avenue in Newton at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, May 17th. Then on May 20th, I'll be at Half Price Books in San Antonio, Texas at 2 p.m. All the details are at RaymondArroyo.com. I'm looking forward to seeing you all. When we return, a major change in leadership of the FBI this week while the administration prepares to arm the Syrian Kurds to battle ISIS. What does it mean to our national security? Deputy Assistant to the President, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, is here with analysis. The world over continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, 
Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. The FBI is currently lacking a permanent director after President Trump fired James Comey this week. Meanwhile, the administration is weighing its options in the fight against ISIS abroad. And what about the lingering threat of a nuclear North Korea? How should the U.S. navigate these national security and foreign policy minefields? Here tonight with analysis is Deputy Assistant to the President, Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Welcome back. Great to be back. Great Robin. to see you. I want to start with the story that's dominating every headline on every network. President Trump fires James Comey. The narrative coming from so many areas of the media, they're saying he did it because Comey was getting too close to this Russian investigation exploring collusion between the Russian government and the Trump campaign. Your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts, uh, number one, that narrative is absurd, and it's another example of not just fake news, but very fake news. Mm. Uh, the fact is, if there was any uh, administration that had unhealthy ties to Moscow, it was the Obama-Clinton administration. Just Google uranium deal and Hillary Clinton. Uh, look at the hot mic incident when President Obama said, I will tell Vlad I will be much more flexible after the election. Mm. Uh, that's very disturbing. In the last nine months, what proof has there been not one scintilla of connections to Russia of any negative nature with the Trump administration or the Trump campaign. So, no, uh, Director Comey was fired because not only had he lost the confidence of the president, who is his superior, mm -hmm. uh, but he'd also lost the confidence of many people on the Hill. You know that. Yep. And also the, the rank and file agents. The president sat with Lester Holt, and uh, this clip has been played in the last few hours as if it's a smoking gun. Watch. Did you call him? Uh, in one case, I called him. In one case, he called me. And did you ask him I under investigation? I actually asked him, yes. I said, if it's possible, would you let me know, am I under investigation? He said, you are not under investigation. Is there a problem here? Some are saying this is Nixonian, the president <laughs> using his power to bully the FBI director to tell him whether he's in, under investigation and quietly intimidating him from continuing a deep investigation into the president. Absurd. I mean, truly, absolutely absurd. Is this how lazy the media has become, that, that anything a president they don't like does has to be labeled as Nixonian? Remember, this is a director of the FBI who, during the Clinton investigations, um, was fine with giving uh, immunity to numerous individuals under investigation, who was fine with the laptops being destroyed, which were key to that actual investigation, and who said totally incorrectly that he found no intent therefore he's not going to recommend prosecution mm -hmm. one of the rare instances in u.s f uh, 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 law where intent is irrelevant is the question of handling of classified information if you accidentally don't handle it correctly you've committed a felony yes. um, the, uh, the the director of the fbi usurped the power of the attorney general when he made that statement and that's why he had to go why was the president so slow to get rid of james comey he knew of this when he took office in january um he's a reasonable man he's a reasonable man and he wanted to see if it was salvageable uh, but after what happened just a few days ago with Director Comey's testimony, which had to be backtracked, corrected, and backpedaled by his superiors, mm -hmm. it was obvious we couldn't wait any longer. Mm -hmm. I want to move on to foreign policy, your area of expertise and, and uh, the, the, the area that you help President Trump with. Uh, the, we are arming the Syrian Kurds in the fight against ISIS. This is vaguely reminiscent of things we talked about on this program a few months ago. The arming of Syrian rebels. And that didn't exactly go as planned. What confidence do you have that arming these Syrian Kurds will help matters? Well, the fact is, uh, it's not a silver bullet. But if you look at the last uh, six years, the Kurds have carved out for themselves a reputation of being uh, some of the most dedicated and capable fighters in the region who wish to push back through the use of force against those who wish to see the establishment mm -hmm. of theocratic, uh, proto-caliphate-like regimes. So um, it's not a solution. It's not something that will by itself get us peace. But the president is committed. We have to stop the conflict. And if there are people who are prepared to take the fight to the extremists, then they de facto uh, must be supported. Mm -hmm. Now, Turkey is none too happy about the bulking up of the Kurds and the arming of the Kurds. The president is meeting with the president of Turkey next week. Your thoughts on how this might impact that relationship and that meeting? 
Um, I don't want to, to second guess what's going to happen uh, with any meeting between Ankara and Washington. But I think uh, if you just look at recent events inside Turkey, um, Turkey, Ankara has had an issue with, with Kurdish independence, mm -hmm. Kurdish movements. But what have they seen in the last 18 months? They've seen ISIS take the fight to Turkey. In fact, one of the recent issues of Dabik, the English language ISIS magazine, on its cover said, we're going to take, da take back Istanbul. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the Turkish Islam, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of Anatolia, of Ankara, of okay. Istanbul, is also anathema to ISIS. So maybe that gives us room for Ankara to reassess who it's going to work with in the future, because we have to stop the bloodshed. Yeah. I know we all are talking, and we have been for months, about ISIS. Mm -hmm. We've forgotten, it seems to me, at least in the media, we're not talking about al-Qaeda, we're not talking about uh, ta the Taliban. Mm -hmm. They are still ascend ascendant. Why have we sort of dropped the attention on them? And it, are we as a government missing this important part of the whole terrorist experiment moving through the Middle East? Uh, if you look at the, the recent statements made by the National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, if you look at the mm -hmm. statements made by the field commander, uh, uh, Nick, Mick, Mick Nicholson in uh, Afghanistan. No, not, not at all. We're, we're finally bringing the requisite attention back because you're absolutely right. Uh, in Africa and in Afghanistan, uh, Al-Qaeda has made hay while the sun shined, whilst the last administration was obsessing on ISIS. Uh, but the fact is it's very disturbing. Uh, they have grown. And not only that, you've seen the Taliban uh, reconnect its allegiances mm -hmm. to these, uh, m these more global organizations like Al-Qaeda. But we're right. finally taking them seriously. Well, uh, as you bring that up, uh, General Nicholson, the top commander in Afghanistan, recently said the Taliban is being armed by Moscow. Mm. Do you believe that? Uh, if he says it, I'm not going to second guess him. He's on the ground. Always listen. Like Teddy Roosevelt said, mm -hmm. it is the man in the arena. So you listen to the man in the arena. Uh, but the fact is we've seen numerous nations um, have satrapies, have client states. This president has sent a very clear message. The Moab bomb isn't just about Afghanistan. Mm. The 59 cruise missiles in Syria aren't just about Syria. He has made a red line, a real red line, and now he's mm. sent a message. Those who have client states need to analyze their internal red lines and just how far they're going to support mm. bad actors. Sebastian, you have long been writing about this war with jihad, how to take it on. Uh, I was at the White House last week. I know you were there as well. We saw each other. Uh, when the president signed this religious freedom executive order where he announced in his first foreign trip he will be going to the Vatican, Israel, and Saudi Arabia yeah. to touch the, the, the centerpieces of the three major monotheistic religions. Now, why Saudi Arabia? What does he plan to do there? And how will this defeat jihad? Again, even with my friends, I have to tell them, this is a White House that doesn't give its playbook away. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Obama administration, we don't show our cards to the people sitting at the poker table. But I think everybody understands uh, we're stepping beyond the so-called sophisticated, postmodern, secular attitudes of, of the last mm. 20, 30 years. And we're going to look at the world as it is and say, look, religion is immensely important for billions of people. And that's why these three countries, and that's why uh, right now is the first trip of the president. We're, we're going to respect the role of religion in people's lives. But at the same time, listen to the speech of the joint session of Congress. We're going to understand the power of religion, not just for good, but also for evil. Mm -hmm. And we have to challenge those who exploit religion for their own purposes. No more jobs for jihadis. We're going to tackle the, 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 the subject at its source. Saudi Arabia Arabia is home to Wahhabism. This is one of the most virulent strains of Islam that really has produced so many of the fighters that have come here to our own shores, meaning harm to our own people and people in Europe. How is engaging Saudi Arabia, where Wahhabism is nourished, going to help matters? Um, it's, it's not something that is happening in a homogenous fashion. So to write off a whole country and say they're part of the problem, I, I don't think is fair. Why? Because Saudi Arabia has suffered, suffered itself since 2004 when Al-Qaeda, when the, when the real hardcore Wahhabists and Takfiri jihadis came back to kill Saudis in Saudi Arabia. So just as Russia, just as uh, China has to reassess its internal red lines, I think Saudi Arabia is thinking twice about just who do we want to be friends with and how deep is that friendship going to be. Mm -hmm. And remember, who is President Donald Trump? He's the master of the deal. Ah, uh, the new.
president of South Korea, I want to jump yes. across the ocean, uh, Moon Jae-in, mm -hmm. has suggested that the way to engage North Korea is in diplomatic talks. What we need is dialogue, a smart approach. Um, at the end of the day, there are very few problems of significance that can only be solved by kinetic things, by the use of force. Mm -hmm. uh, Clausewitz said it 250 years ago. Um, war is the continuation of politics by other means. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to have that political end state in mind. Uh, this president understands that you use all the levers of power at the same time. It's diplomacy backed up by the use of force mm -hmm. if necessary. To we get people to the table. We saw that in Syria. We saw that with regards uh, to Afghanistan. Um, but at the end of the day, um, talking is, is not a bad thing, but you've got to have realistic expectations, mm. and, and this president does. Before I let you go, a new cybersecurity yes. executive order signed this week. What does it do? Why do we need it now? Because cyber has become one of the new dimensions of warfare. Mm. Uh, it's not just about the physical. It's not just about the intelligence. It really is about this new domain of activity. And the fact is we have to take it seriously because there are nation state actors and non-nation state actors who are exploiting the cyber domain to hurt us and our friends. And this executive order is going to help us take that more seriously. Mm. Sebastian Gorka, before I, I release you totally, there were so many reports in the last few weeks, and I have to tell you, it, it surprised me a bit. They were publishing your political obituary. Sebastian Gorka is out. He's gone. He's on his way out any day now. What happened? Uh, as I look, I tell everybody in the last 15 weeks, I've come to understand about 80 to 90 percent of what they write about the White House is just absolutely fallacious. So yet again, very fake news. Yep. Glad to see you still standing, Great Sebastian you. Gorka. Thank you for being here. Yep. When we return, a community of young priests is putting Gregorian chant back on the Billboard classical charts with a new CD, Requiem. We'll introduce you to two of them when we return. The World Over continues in a moment. Stay right here. to the world over that was the fraternity with a selection of their new major label debut requiem from de montfort music and sony classical for centuries gregorian chant has been used in the liturgy of the church really for every occasion this new recording by the fraternity actually they're the priestly fraternity of saint peter is climbing up the record charts and here to discuss requiem is the north american superior of the fraternity father gerard saguto and next to him, the musical director of Requiem, Father Zachary Akers. Fathers, thank you both for being here. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to start with the, the title and the approach here. Of all the Gregorian chant, of all the, the, the great repository in the church that you could capture on CD, why a Requiem? Well, the reason, a couple of reasons practically, first of all, is that the Requiem Mass is something so well known to us mm -hmm. as priests that it was easy to put together. So uh -huh. it was easy to get the priests together to sing this, and uh, that's what we did. But on a, on, a, on a wider, more spiritual basis is that, you know, death is something common to us all. We wanted to touch on that, that spiritual reality, mm -hmm. to reach out to a, a wider audience about the reality that this life is supposed to be a means to an end. So mm -hmm. we decided to use this text and, the, and these chants uh, because it was trying to reach out for the very reality that we all share you as know, human beings. Divorced from the Requiem Mass, when you hear it, it's actually uplifting and transcendent. It's not very dour and sad. And, but I have to say, when I was listening, knowing what it was and remembering certain phrases, I, it did make me think, is this a Requiem for our age? Is that what this is, <laughs> Father? Well, you do hear the two different sounds on this, uh, this album. You have this sorrowful sound because we're mourning the, the loss of our loved one, but yet uh, there's also this hope because God is merciful. And so it's a prayer, and I think it comes across uh, in the CD. Father Akers, I, I was interested to learn your mother played chant for you when you were a child. That's right. You, were you trained in music? No, actually, I found out years later that when I, when I was a child misbehaving, my brother and I shared the room and we were always fighting. 
And so she would play at night to calm us down as we were going to bed, would play a Gregorian chant outside the, outside the door. Wow. So then when I went to college and I started to uh, become more interested in, in sacred music, and I visited monasteries, and, and I really started to listen to the Gregorian chant, so much so that when I came to the seminary, it, it, kind of, it, came, it came very easy to me to pick up this style of singing. Thank goodness she wasn't playing Charo for you. you know, that's good. I'm glad it was Chant. Uh, Father, I want to uh, ask you, the, tell me the vintage of this music. This, the history and the, the, how far back does this go? When people hear Requiem, they usually think Mozart. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, very common. Uh, Mozart, Duraflé, all those commonly known uh, be composers, beautiful classical yeah. composers. But this music goes way back. It extends back uh, to the early centuries of the church. It's uh, it's one of these things that the chant itself is very ancient, and as it's been developed over the centuries, and the music that was composed and put together, and, and the, the liturgy came together, you know, we have we have chants that are that are centuries and centuries old, and even some of these uh, right. some of the music itself dates back even to, to uh, pre-Christian times. Yeah, so no, you can hear itself. the Hasidic strains in certain mm -hmm. parts of the Gregorian exactly. chant. I always think, you know, yeah, if, right. if you, when you catch it at the right tone and angle. And I have to say, listening to this, and I listened very closely twice to the whole CD, um, one doesn't get the feeling that this is being sung. It feels as if these voices are welling up from the ground almost. They sort of well and hover and then float away. It's a quality that you all have that I have to say is not in many, I have a lot of Gregorian chant. I listen to it when I write, I listen to it when I'm working on things. Um, what do you think distinguishes your approach and, and that sound? Well, that's really the goal of, of this style of singing in Gregorian chant. As you can see uh, in, in, in the promotional video, we stand in a circle, and uh, th the goal is to have this unified sound. So we hear that even with uh, the, the cameraman who, who was filming during the recording, and he, he was very, uh, it was mysterious to him where the sound was coming from. Mm. Because he heard this unified sound and he would look, zoom in on the particular mouths, and but he couldn't figure natural. out where it was coming from. But it was this oh. unified sound, even though we come from so many different areas. Yeah, it has that, it has that um, ethereal quality to it that is really, it's, 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 it's spellbinding to listen to. This is Grammy-winning producer Christopher Alder, who produced this album. He had this to say about the fraternity, listen. This order obviously put a lot of emphasis on musical training. They're very concentrated. They know this stuff intimately. It seems to roll from them like poetry one has learnt many times. Christopher Alder talking about Requiem. Um, is there truth to that? Is it the, is it the working together in the seminary in, on a daily basis in community? Is that what promotes this kind of unified sound? Definitely it does. From the very first time you step into the seminary as a, as just, as a new seminarian, you're immersed in chant from day one. And for seven years, it's constant singing of chant. You learn it, it's part, it's, 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 we're immersed in it. It becomes not just ornamental, but very, it's as integral to our life. It's the way you pray. How, what's the big emphasis in your, in your community on chant? How pervasive is it? I mean, I imagine a lot of your, your priests are not musicians when they come through the That's door. right. There are even some, some men who enter the seminary uh, tone deaf, as it were, but then they leave having a great um, ability to sing th these beautiful and ancient uh, music. Mm. We sing every day at the seminary four different times at, at least whenever we sing the Divine Office, the Liturgy mm. of the Hours. Give me a sense of the men we're hearing and seeing here. Where did they come from? Is this one community? Is this your headquarters? Or are you bringing seminarians and, and priests from all over the world. Well, the entire, the, the ensemble was 12 priests from the uh, North American district. Okay. So we selected men who we've sung with over the years, but it was men who were ordained less than a year to men who were ordained, you know, 13, 14 years. So it was a, a little bit of a reunion for us. We had a lot of fun doing it. And it was, uh, it was just trying to find a blend that we knew was going to work. And with a lot of, with, with little preparation, we recorded everything in a matter of two days with one day of rehearsal. Where did you re record? At the seminary in, uh, in uh, our, our seminary in Lincoln, our Lady Guadalupe Seminary. Mm. Yeah. And, and give me a sense of how big the priestly fraternity of St. Peter is. I mean, people hear of the, of the fraternity. I guess that's your new lingo, the fraternity. The fraternity, yeah. <laughs> but I know it as the priestly fraternity of St. Peter. That's right. How large is it? How many nations does it encompass? Right. So when we were founded in 1988, uh, with just 12 members, by, founded by Pope St. John Paul II and mm -hmm. Cardinal Ratzinger. And now, just 28 years later, we have... 450 members from 
over 30 different countries throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And we have 160 seminarians studying to be priests in our community. Wow, amazing. And what is the mission? What is the mission and the vocation of the group? It's charism. The charism is actually the sanctification of the priest. We're a congregation of priests that have a certain communal life that we come together, and that we that we live, we worship together. You know, but then from there, we serve in various capacities. In this country, the United States, Canada, and Mexico, we serve generally as parish priests. Right. And so we have our own parish centers. We have, but, but we try to have a community life within that parish so that every, so our priests are constantly trying to support each other in our mission for our own sanctification. But from that, we try mm -hmm. to bring what we have to the faithful. Yeah, and, and I know the Tridentine is a big part of your life too, to the Tridentine mm -hmm. Mass. Obviously, this music doesn't live in f floating in the ether. It is part of the liturgy of the church, and particularly the Tridentine, the Latin Mass, now mm -hmm. called the extraordinary mm -hmm. form of the Mass. Why is that form so attractive, do you think? And why do we see so many young people drawn to it? Well, as I travel around the country uh, as the director of development, a lot of young men mention to me that their interest in, in joining our community because they're drawn. We see throughout throughout the world, people are people are drawn to beauty, to something that is uh, ancient, and 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 uh, I think this this really this experience of a Latin Mass, many people find uh, is transcendent, and they want to be part of that. If they're giving their life to our Lord, uh, this this draws them. Uh, yeah. Father Gerard, give me a sense of why you believe people who are not Catholic are so drawn to this music. There, there is something here that pulls them in, it seems. I think because it is so otherworldly, that's really what the music is. It's, everywhere we go, there's noise. Everywhere, uh, from the airport to a, to, to base to outside on the streets, yeah. there's something about this music that just simply is, is very, uh, it pierces through our defenses. It, there's a very vertical quality to it, which it, it speaks to the very to, to certain movements in our soul that seeks for something greater than this life can give. Yeah. And no matter who hears it, where you are, who you are, you, it automatically, even, even the, the most rabid unbeliever, they're going to listen to this and it's going to make them pause for a moment to think there might be something greater mm -hmm. out there. And obviously there is. Well, there's a reason that this is topping the, the music charts and yeah. it hasn't even been released yet. Listen to this. Here's a little snippet of Requiem. That quality of sacrality, calm, I do think the whole world yearns for that, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain that in your daily life as a layperson? Your advice would be what? have at least 15 minutes a day where you learn to pray and meditate. Mm -hmm. 15, you know, if you take five minutes a day for some spiritual reading and give God 10 minutes of actual one-to-one -one prayer and revisit that mo moment of prayer throughout the day, even if it's just for, for a minute, you know, look at a crucifix, look at a statue, come back to that moment and you'll find yourself always being grounded or centered throughout your day upon the most important things. Mm -hmm. So you, put, you try to put everything you do at the very heart, uh, at, at, at the very service of God. Uh, one of the things I loved about this, Father Akers, um, it, it is a progression. These are stages of the, the requiem. Walk us through a little of that. I mean, don't, not bit by bit, but tell me what the, the musical experience is on the CD. It's not just random selections and tracks. Right. So from track one all the way to the end of, this, of the CD, we begin where someone has died. And so it begins at the home of the deceased. We're with the family. And uh, we process with the body uh, to the church. And you, you'll hear the tolling of the bells. Right. And we process in for the special anaphon welcoming this body. And then we begin with the mass. And so from track four on, we have the prayers of the mass these beautiful ancient uh, prayers that are sung uh, the same way that they've been sung uh, for the last you know, several centuries. And then we, we go through the prayers of the Mass until the very end where there's the blessing of the body and then back processing out with uh, the body to the cemetery. Father Gerard, your hope for people listening, for the first time perhaps, to chant and to your community? I hope they see, first of all, for Catholics, that they understand there is a 
greater, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a depth to our worship, there's a depth mm -hmm. to a, a Catholic life. This is the music of the church. I want them to be able to hear this and, and, and have that touch their soul. For, the, for a wider community, for the non-Catholics, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for those who are secular, to hear this and say, what about the Catholic Church? What about God? What about this life? What's, mm -hmm. to, to make them start asking questions. You know, Christ says, go out and sow seeds. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's going to sow seeds and we'll find some fertile soil for it to uh, land on and, and, sp and sprout something that will uh, pay back 30-fold mm -hmm. or 100-fold. Father Zachary Akers, before I let you go, the most surprising thing that you've encountered since you've been talking about this, traveling around, I know you're talking to everybody about this uh, project. That's right. Why is, how is Requiem resonated with people? Well, people are, uh, are are amazed at the sense of, of peace that they hear in this singing. And um, already, even though it hasn't been released, um, I, I've already encountered a lot of people who have seen the video and are amazed at this kind of music and this way of life, uh, this this Catholic way of life is still being lived today. Mm. Beautiful. Father Seguto, Father Akers, thank you so much for being here. Thanks thank for having me. Uh, Requiem by the Fraternity from De Montfort Music and Sony Classical is available Friday, May 12th, wherever music is sold, online at Amazon, iTunes, and demontfortmusic.com. You can also find the video we were talking about there. It's worth looking at. When we return, it's been 100 years since the Marian apparitions at Fatima. How relevant is this message today? Dominican Father Thomas Petri is here to enlighten us. When the world over continues, stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over. On May 13, 1917, the Virgin Mary appeared to three shepherd children near Fatima, Portugal. The children, Francisco and Jacinta Marto, and their cousin Lucia, were all between seven and ten years old when the Virgin appeared to them on six occasions. She delivered a message of peace and conversion, and really prophecy in so many ways. And this message continues in our time. As Pope Francis visits Fatima and canonizes two of the visionaries, how relevant is the Fatima message today? And what of that controversial third secret that was revealed in 2000? Joining me with insight is the Vice President and Academic Dean of the Dominican House of Studies here in Washington, Father Thomas Petrie. Father, thanks for being on thanks the program. Thanks for having me, Raymond. Uh, let's wonderful. start with this. Uh, why did the Virgin Mary appear to these three children over six months? What was the message? Why them? Well, I always go to her very first words to them, which are the words we still know from Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. The early 20th century was already a time when science was on the rise, secularism, as you said, was on the rise, Christians were being pushed out of the public square already. There was an increase of, of Freemasonry attempting to develop a sort of godless spirituality. Marriages were all, also starting to suffer and war was around the corner. Mm -hmm. And so the Blessed Mother appeared to them in a sort of symbol of hope to tell them that if you pray, if you pray for the conversion of sinners and for peace, my immaculate heart will triumph. It's a message of hope um, it was, it, to these three innocent children. Yeah, and one of the messages was, one of her commands was that Russia be consecrated to her Immaculate Heart. Now, explain to people who might not know, what does that mean to consecrate uh, a country to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and was that accomplished? Well, she was very clear that communism was going to be one of the great evils of the world. And, and that it, Russia would spread its errors. And it, and, it, and it did, and it did. And we're often, we often hear, well, you know, we haven't consecrated Russia uh, to the Immaculate Heart as Our Lady of Fatima asked. But St. John Paul II did consecrate the whole world, and this is a question that comes up again and again. But he is the successor of Peter, and he says, I did it, it was done. And of course, we must not forget that it was St. John Paul II um, who helped to bring down the communist yeah. empire of the Soviet Union. And Sister Lucia at one point confirmed that she believed the absolutely, consecration had been accomplished. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it shows you the power of the Blessed Mother. I mean, the Blessed Mother says this will happen, it's going to happen. And, and that odd combination, that, that dance with Fatima and John Paul II, it was on May 13th, 
1981. That's right. When he, that assassin's bullet penetrated him and could have killed him. It was that close. That's right. And he took the bullet and put it in the crown mm -hmm. of the statue of Our Lady of Fatima at the shrine. And attributed her intercession to saving him. Of course, the, the assassin claimed that every time he had a clean shot, this woman in, in a white veil would move into his, his <laughs> sight lines. You don't mess with the Blessed Mother. Yeah, you don't. She has her she has her eye on you. She's got her hand she's got you in her hands. She'll take care of you. Let's talk about the three secrets. Uh, the first was a vision of hell. These little babies were oh. had terrifying visions of hell. Yes, yeah. And they say that Francisco, who was the middle of the two, that yeah. he was not the most well-behaved child until he saw this vision <laughs> of hell. And he really, apparently they, they asked the Blessed Mother, will they all go to heaven? And, and the Blessed Mother said, all of you will, but Francisco will need a lot more rosaries. Oh, well, well you see, but now he's going to make it this weekend. He's going to make the it. The church is uh, affirming. Uh, World War II would end was the second secret. Mm -hmm. And the third secret, let's get to that because this is the one that gets all the attention. Yeah. Now, years ago, back in 2000, I was at that press conference when Cardinal Bertone came out and unveiled then Cardinal Ratzinger's interpretation of the third secret at the behest of John Paul II, who was still a sitting pope. And their interpretation was it is an allegorical message of a man in white climbing over dead bodies and the wreckage of a city and things are smoking. And as he climbs to the top of the hill, he is shot from all directions by arrows and bullets, he goes down. He does go down in That's the, in the, the prophecy. That's it. That's right, in the prophecy. And I think it's important to understand in the history of the revelations of even Jesus Christ to St. Mary Faustina, mm -hmm. sometimes they're very explicit. Do this, I want you to do that. Most of those three secrets of uh, Fatima, the, the children were shown visions. You know, they were shown images of war, images of hell, and this great image of the mountain of bodies and the, and the bishop yeah. dressed in white. And so they do lend themselves to interpretation, and there's always going to be room to say, uh, well, I don't believe in that interpretation. I'm not sure it's true. And a lot of people are saying that. Well, but St. John Paul II believed, and he's a saint, he's a great pope, that the secret was fulfilled in his assassination, and it is certainly providential, as you mm -hmm. said, that it happened on the well, feast day. And, and uh, Ratzinger's interpretation was, now Pope Benedict, uh, his interpretation was that it was prayer it was that prayer. Uh, that changed and altered the outcome of the prophecy. That's right. But that John Paul was the fulfillment of it, and that represented the 20th century, all the martyrs that he climbed over, and uh, though he went down, he wasn't down. He wasn't. He, in, in, in the vision, it's not clear he dies in the vision, even though he goes mm -hmm. down, and Sister Lucia confirmed that. It wasn't clear to them that the, the man in but white But she died. continued having visions, right? She did. In the monastery. Not, in the monastery. Lucia lived 97 years and old. And she knew that. The Blessed Mother told her that the, the two children, the Two others would be taken early, and they were only ta they they died only a couple of years after the la after the visions of Fatima. Sister Lucia lived her life a long life, and she was given other visions of the Blessed Mother, which she recorded. For instance, the Blessed Mother told her at the time, this is in the 1920s, that most marriages were not of God. Told her that most people who would go to hell would probably go to hell because of sins of impurity. Mm. Said that priests need to maintain their purity and their devotion to the Son. Mm. But she was always clear, do not be afraid because my immaculate heart will triumph. Tell me in the final analysis, Pope Francis says he is going to entrust the eternal fate of mankind to Mary. What's the message for people looking in, people who've never heard of Fatima? What is the message they need to take away? I think that's a very wise and prudent move by Pope Francis. I would think of no one better to trust the fate of mankind than to Our Lady of Fatima because she made it very clear in her messages and her visions to the, to the children that she was concerned about the state of humanity and making sure that as many as possible would come to glory in her son mm. in, the, in the hereafter, in heaven. And, it's and really that's what we want. It's a plea of prayer. At the it's end of the day, it's a plea of prayer. 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 And conversion. Pray for sinners and for peace every day. That's what she wants. Pray for sinners and for peace. Mm. Pray for their conversion. Father Petrie, thank you for being thank you here. Thank you for having me. And, and I, I, I figured you'd, you'd back John Paul II since you have his designer. He, I know we, 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 we shop in the same place as the Very Pope's good. Design. You have good taste. It's, it's an, you know, it never goes out of fashion. Never goes out that of That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links or at RaymondArroyo.com, as are the details of my Boston and San Antonio book signings. Be sure to join us next week. All oh, political sage and author Pat Buchanan 
will be here. Talking about his new book, Nixon's White House Wars. And Dr. Meg Meeker returns to talk about parenting and being the strong father your children need. And there may be a surprise or two. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. Before I let you go, I ask your prayers for Father Petrie's sister, Carolyn. She had a stroke this past week, and I know she could use those prayers. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching and for always being here. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.